Barry Walker is a psychedelic pioneer. He is probably the most talented psychotherapist, psychedelic psychotherapist I've encountered. And um, he's a musician, a map strain therapist, and uh, on faculty at the Ketamine Training Center. Welcome and glad to have you here, Barry. Thank you. That's a great introduction. Can we stop right there? That's, that's really all I need. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to start by just asking a little bit about psychedelics and the impact they've had on your work, because you have a really rich background as a psychotherapist, a psychoanalyst, a, um, a bioenergetic Jungian analyst. So it was quite interesting. I remember talking to you about what psychedelics and the introduction of them did for you in terms of your own thoughts about psychotherapy. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, like a lot of people, I got introduced to the field, uh, you know, in a kind of background way, 10, 15 years ago. When I was much younger in my, you know, back in the 1960s, I got introduced to all the substances that are now up for legalization. Um, and uh, I got to experience a lot, but I experienced a lot without the framework of uh, an education in psychotherapy and psychology or in the theories of personality and character. Um, and then of course they became illegal uh, and then I didn't have anything to do with them, but then about, ten, about 15 years ago, I was offered uh, in a social setting, uh, a, a, a drug, a, a medicine, uh, you know, w one of the ones we know. And, um, I, well, I had a wonderful experience. I, I, the, the leftover from the, the experience was mostly like, oh my God, I, I, the, the experience completely infiltrated my sense of competency in the world of psychology. It, I, I had a reaction of, on the one hand, tremendous joy and freedom and pleasure. I was with my friends and family. And on the other hand, I felt that my career and what I devoted my life to understanding as, as an analyst, as a somatic uh, type therapist, all of that stuff suddenly seemed irrelevant. And, and I couldn't understand why. Could not, could not understand why. Uh, I, so I spent a considerable time after that opening session and others that I, I, I uh, encountered with myself and my friends, I spent considerable time trying to make sense of why I had suddenly dropped into a, a, a kind of defeated place. Like it was it, that what I was doing in the regular world of psychotherapy and my 50 minute hours was irrelevant. I'm not, not saying this is for everybody, I'm saying it is for me. And um, I, after a period of time of being, um, uh, you know, sad or feeling lost, I guess you might say, I began to understand what it was that the medicines were doing. And I began to see how my experience of them could impact my understanding of psychotherapy, period. All the psychotherapy I'd learned, whether it was bioenergetics or Jungian analysis or Gestalt therapy or CBT or in family systems or whatever it was, uh, that this, these substances brought an amazing accelerant, an amazing uh, uh, lubricant for depth process that happened almost immediately. Uh, and I was also aware that I was not prepared to know what to do with it. But I watched, I started to offer it to, to I offered an experience to some clients who then provided their own materials. And I began to, um, to uh, rewrite in my own mind how to do psychotherapy when they when it was medicine assisted, and uh, I'm still doing that now. In fact, I'm doing that with you, as as you well know, and uh, I have been stunned at the I, all the all my teachers, many great teachers, would now be laughing at a party in their graves uh, with each other because it's so obvious. How, what a beautiful add-on this, this is to the efficacy of great psychotherapy, where psychotherapy becomes not just fixing stuff that's wrong, it becomes an invitation into life. It, be, it becomes an inspiration into knowing yourself, not just a pill that you get handled or, or an analysis that explains why you're screwed up. Uh, 
but it, it, th these, these medicines in the right hands with the right people facilitating and the right work having been done and the right ground and all that stuff are, uh, are miraculous uh, if we choose to, to see them that way. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. I went all the way from irrelevance to a sense of, I, I don't know if I can get this done in my lifetime. There's so much here. There's just so much. In working with you, I always feel like um, your relationship to music and yeah. how central that is to you really informs your work. Could you talk a little bit about music, your relationship, how that plays and how you think of it in the psychedelic yes. space? Yes. Uh, you've tapped into something which is current with me right now. Uh, I, you know, I've used, I've, I've been pretty good at making playlists over the years. And I've, in, in working with ketamine, for example, with you, we've developed uh, um, playlists of music that have, that are eight, you know, that are uh, non-rhythmic to, um, to inspirational, to classical, to tonal, all those things that we've looked at. We're not the only ones, of course, a lot of people have done great stuff, but all of that has been in it. All of that has been uh, to develop playlists that play from outside the person's experience into their experience. It's all comes from speakers or earphones across the room or around their ears. You see, we haven't yet, but we're about to learn how to let the person's experience design the music. We're about to. And uh, some of my uh, uh, genius uh, friends uh, in the field of audio uh, recording and um, uh, playback, like Edgar Chueri, for example, who's invent, invented the Bach SP system, uh, we're right on top of being able to use a person's experience of themselves to produce the sound uh, with using uh, EEG. Uh, that being said, um, I've, I personally have had tremendous, uh, <laughs> I've loved being a DJ. I love being a DJ. I love being able to intuitively feel where somebody is. You can look at their breathing patterns, look at the, what seems to be going on with in, in, in the color of their skin and imagining what music might, what sound might deepen their experience, might accompany their experience. So, so I've learned to look at people's breathing rhythms and then I have stashes of music that, are, that fit that rhythm, fit that rhythm. Uh, I've been able to um, acquaint myself with geniuses in the field of, of uh, you know, music uh, composition, like Garth Stevenson, for example, who plays the double bass. And playing the double bass is, 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 um, is not what he's doing. He is being the double bass, is what he is. He, he is at one with his instrument. And it, it's, it's a, a, an unbelievable experience. I, I use, I use um, the experience of music, but I also use the experience of location. Maybe there's a fire in the fireplace in the room and the crackle sound. Maybe there's a door open and there's rain outside. Maybe the wind is blowing. Maybe the birds are chirping. You know, maybe there's a, um, a, 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 a sense of um, uh, movement. You know, maybe the person moves, I move. There's a sense of, of being present in real time as, as people. So I, I've done that a lot. Uh, but I want to tell you, I'm, I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people out there now who are interested in the sound of, of ketamine therapy, for example. The sounds of it. And it's the sound of the people. Who, what sound, what music are the people that we're working with making? We're very close to being able to produce that while it's happening. How exciting is that? Yeah, thank you, Barry. Yeah, you really get a sense of the subtlety of your work and the real um, respect for the presence in the present moment in yeah. how, you, how you work. I, I want to hear a little bit more. Perhaps you could share how you work with ketamine and your thoughts about ketamine. And yeah. specifically, I know that's one you're very interested in exp yeah, experienced I with. I am. So I'm, I'm going to assume that people watching this uh, are already up on ketamine. Um, I mean, I, I don't have to go through the the, the whole um, chemistry and the science and the neuroscience and everything else of it. Uh, it is, of course, a legal drug that we use off-label. Uh, I, I do this with you. 
you're, you're a medical doctor and you can prescribe this and, and, to, and you can supervise. I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but we do this together. And uh, what I find is that in the right application, when you can feel where a person is, you can feel how, how, where their foundation is. You can feel where their foundation is not. You can feel where their grip on reality is strong, where it is not. And then you apply in the right dosage a, 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 some ketamine that doesn't scare people because they have to navigate the unknown so hugely, but it invites them into knowing themselves. It invites them into a rich experience. Uh, and it mean, that means different doses for different people. And the, the skill that you, you show over and over again, and I'm, we both do together, is to know who gets what, you see, and, and, and what the experience is. Uh, what I find is I find myself totally delighted to, to be with people when they're totally delighted, or they're totally needy, or they're totally present. Ketamine produces presence. It produces presence presence. Maybe it's because it reduces anxiety in the, in the moment. Maybe it takes away uh, self-doubt and maybe it takes away uh, depression. Maybe it does in, 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 you know, actually in the office, but it, it, um, when that person becomes alive in being who they are in the moment and they've stepped out of the, the membrane of their defenses, they've stopped interacting with the world from a safety point of view, and a survival point of view, and they're just with me and you in the office being themselves. And, and we, as you know, we have, have 15, 20 minutes, half an hour more of the, that glorious space of being in undefended uh, um, and, and sweet and tender with people. You know, because we, we, we've been there over and over again. Uh, so I, what I find, um, and, and, however, is that over time, the use of ketamine is not a one-off. It's, it's, it's for me, it's, it's, a, it's an assistance that I build into a therapy. So I, I'm going to use, I tell a story about myself. May I do that? Definitely. So um, over, the, over the years, you and I have been involved in doing ketamine sessions with each other. Uh, there was a time about a year ago where uh, you gave me, uh, I think it was maybe 30 milligrams intramuscularly, and um, uh, you sat with me, and uh, what came up for me was a, internally was, a, I've done this 20, 30, 40 times, so what came up in, for me was an, a familiar uh, tableau. Uh, there, there were the colors and the movement and the, the 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 um the, the bright leaves and flowers that i always see and then because we had prepped it because we talked about it and because it wasn't an overwhelming dose i found myself watching myself as a 2 year old i could see myself sitting on the bed in a pair of 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 shorts and a shirt that my mother had me pose for a picture in and my mother's sitting there right next to the, to the bed. And here I am at, at my age thinking this stuff. And I'm, I'm watching myself watch my mother. And, uh, uh, and I'm looking at her and I can feel that age old feeling in me saying, feeling like I'm not being seen. I'm not being seen. Maybe I don't matter. Uh, what, what's wrong? I, 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 I'm jockeying around trying to find a way to get seen. I'm looking at her eyes. I'm, 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 I'm all that stuff. I can see, I can see myself doing it. And then all of a sudden in this familiar, uh, adventure, I looked really closely at my mother and I saw that she couldn't see her young son, me. She actually couldn't see him. And it wasn't, it wasn't me. It wasn't the young son that was the problem. It was her. She was in trouble. She couldn't feel the moment. She, you know, she couldn't. She couldn't fulfill the the ancient drive of her DNA, which is to bond with her baby. She couldn't feel it. Couldn't feel it. And I, 
so instead of being of being centered on what I didn't get and what I couldn't feel, for the first time in my entire life, I kind of felt compassion for my mother. I got I kind of felt sort of a generous love for her. She her husband was at war. Uh, she had never done deep work in herself. Whatever it was that calling to bond with her son wasn't there. And I could feel the missing. I could feel the loneliness of that. I could feel the chaos of it. And I, I released myself in that moment with you. You were sitting there. I released myself in that moment from carrying around the, the uh, conclusion that nobody could see me. You know, I, I, and since I had carried it around my entire life that I needed to be seen and that I wasn't being seen I my whole life. And so I, you can imagine what a shock that was to, to even telling you this right now. It reminds me of what a shock it was. It brings up feelings, feelings in me similar to what I had at the time. Um, I'm extremely grateful that we did that that day. Uh, a, month, a year, year and several months ago. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for sharing that very moving uh, story. Mm. It really captures, I think, the potential and the value of, of psychedelics in general, but particularly about ketamine and how mm. it works. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you weave ketamine into your psychotherapy practice. And specifically, I think it might be helpful because I do think the way in which you really think about the sculpture of character is so unique and so brilliant, actually. Could you talk a little bit about how you think of character and then how you insert ketamine, I know specifically use ketamine, um, in trying to open up and invite a process? Thank you. So it's often thought in our, in our industry a lot of people want to sidestep the fact that they have a, a personality and a character and just right off into sort of the spiritual sunset. Uh, they want to get beyond themselves. These are, this, you, you know, this language as well as I do. They want to get beyond themselves. They want to get themselves out of the way. They want to get over themselves. They want to recover from themselves, all, all, all that stuff. And, and uh, so a lot of therapists in a lot of ways, uh, not all, but, but, but some do, try to provide people with ways to do that. And psychedelics can, if you look at it, look at them and engage them in the right way, they can take you to places other than yourself, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean you can leave yourself behind. You can't. You can't leave your knees behind. You can't leave your eyes behind. You can't leave your daily pulses behind. You can't. You can't leave your endocrine system behind. You can't. It's part of you, and your character, yourself, yourself. I'm going to call it character or self. Yourself is a system of of survival that you've developed from the get go to know the difference between you and everyone else. You know, you have a self that you that is not myself, it's yourself. And uh, it, it's a way of recognizing yourself. You know, who am I? Uh, well, let's see, I'm, uh, I have a fair amount of energy, I'm, I'm thoughtful, uh, I'm afraid to, uh, to extend myself in certain ways, I'm this, I'm that, I'm all these other things. So this, the recipe of character that each one of us has is assembled into a self, yourself. So, uh, and myself. So when people come to me and they say, for example, um, they'll say uh, something like, uh, you know, I, I'm aware as successful as I've been that I still feel a deep sense of not being worthy. I, I hear that. I feel a deep sense of not being worthy. And, and so the normal therapist might say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't mean this, but oh, I'm sorry that you feel that way. It, that's painful. What I say is, oh, you don't feel worthy. I, I want to hear how you don't feel worthy. So they tell me. And then I said, what's the payoff for not feeling worthy? That's what I say to them. What's the payoff? 
what is not being worthy doing for you? What is anxiety doing for you? What is depression doing for you? What is prejudice and, and cynicism and bitterness and being a victim? What is all that doing for you? And, and after we get over the unusualness of the question, we move towards the possibility that what we've thought of is wrong with us, that's what's wrong with us, is actually trying to, trying to save us, trying to save us. So how does not being good enough or not being worthy protect you? So that's, that's, that's not just a sophist, sophistry question, it's, it's, uh, it's real. So I then bring, if I can get somebody to consider that, I then bring them into uh, is ketamine assisted sessions where I invite them through their intention and through what they've done with me beforehand, I invite them to, to at least have that question there. What does my lack of self-worth do for me? What's the payoff here? And while there are as many different ketamine experiences as there are uh, people, I am fortunate to be able to either in the session or in the integration afterwards. In the integration afterwards, if we do, if we do what you and I do, which is a, a trio of intramuscular session uh, 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 events over two hours, then we talk with people, and they're they're open and they're. Uh, vulnerable and they're somewhat safe. They become detached from the unsafety. Become, you know, and you're particularly good at that, by the way. You have a reassuring presence with people that is quite remarkable. It's a vibration that's quite remarkable, and um, and then they start to listen. They start to deal with the question of how does my how does my self worth issue, you know, how does it protect me? And the answer might be something as simple as, and they come as what I found in my ketamine session with you, where I found it wasn't me that wasn't good enough. It was that my mother uh, couldn't see me, poor dear. So what not being good enough does is it protects me from uh, hope, that I can be seen. It protects me from uh, risking the adventure of being wide open again. It, provo it, it protects me from being uh, uh, full of illuminated life, which I have had the experience of leading to pain and leading to rejection at an age when my, my body and my being couldn't take it. And I see that over and over again. So what happens in, a, in the integration of a ketamine session often is um, we hold hands and we hold hands while we discuss and feel that very fragile uh, idea, that very fragile self-statement of the thing that I thought was wrong with me is what I'm doing to make myself safe. And you, and in that moment, when the person's no longer a victim or feeling bad about themselves, the shame goes away and they just acknowledge that this is who they've become. It, this is, this is the, the art, these are the artifacts of their life, not whether they're good or they're bad. And to be with somebody when they discover that it's just the artifacts of their life, the ingredients of the recipe of who they are, rather than declarations of this is bad and that's good, to be in that moment with somebody is to be in, you know, in the altar of, of existence. It's beautiful. And that's what we often do. And you know we do. <laughs> when it's we very work. respectful. It's such a respectful process. Yes. One of the things um, I really admire about, one of the many things I really admire about you and the way you work is the way you listen. Um, so thoroughly and use yourself actually as an instrument, a listening instrument. I was wondering if you could take us through so people get a sense of the way in which you use yourself in session, psychedelic sessions, particularly where I think the, where the whole um, atmosphere is so conducive towards healing. Yes. Almost everybody goes into a psychedelic session anxious and as they should. I mean, it's a, it, you, because the, the, uh, the details of yourself as you know you are beginning to disintegrate. 
brought on by uh, the medicine. So when people are in that uh, anxious state, they regress, as do I, by the way. I get anxious before every session. I do, and I regress a little bit. What I do is say to myself, who, what is the light of the, what's the core light of this person? Who are they at their best? What's their, you know, how would they like to see themselves? How would they like to have me see them? Uh, and I can often figure it out pretty quickly because I've been doing this for 50 years. You know, I can see it pretty, pretty quickly. So the way I use myself is to feel, to feel, to find a part of me that likes the people I'm working with. I say to myself, fall in love with this person. I say that to myself. And then I say, how is my body reacting to being with this person? How much of that reaction is me and how much am I actually receiving them in some way? Uh, I, I say to myself, um, uh, uh, what clues is this person giving me about who they are at their best and who they are in their most lovable place when they're free? Who, what clues? And then I pick up the clues and I go with them. And I recognize, so I'll say to somebody, I'll see, for instance, uh, I'll see a kindness in somebody's eyes. And I'll say, boy, I really feel the kindness in your eyes. And I, and I said, I will say, I feel um, it, it arouses in me a kindness towards you and, and the, the sensitivity of this moment that we're in together. Uh, I'll see somebody's uh, tightness in their jaw, you know, their teeth, and I'll say, Ah, this is a moment that that I, you're holding on a little bit. I can tell, you know, you're holding on, and and I'll put it that way, you're holding on, and they, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I say, and, and I'll say, well, then we'll get into conversation. Why are you hold? What? Why is it a good thing to hold on? Let's let's talk about that, instead of condemning it and saying, oh, I'm got to get over the holding on. And um, so I use my intuition. I use my sensitivity. I use my desire to be in relationship with the people I'm working with. I, I use my desire to be in relationship with them. And, and um, I don't always pull it off, but I'll do a lot. I do a lot. And I consider that I have so much gratitude that somebody would sit down in front of me, with me, and agree to take off their mask, take off their armor, to have courage to go into themselves, to know themselves better. I tell you, if you, it makes me want to get down on the floor and, and, and bow. I mean, that is an astonishing moment. And so I let myself feel it as an honor, an honor. It's an honor rather than as an occasion to diagnose, if you know what I mean. Diagnosis is easy. Connecting heart to heart is a little more difficult. Thank you, Barry. Um, I wanted to, you have such an um, encyclopedic knowledge of working with these medicines and have your career has spanned enough time that there's also been opportunities for you to explore working with these different medicines when they weren't um, so regulated. But I wonder if you could speak to, if we put aside regulating practices, how one makes, or how you specifically, in an ideal world, would make assessments about which medicine you would use, yes. um, and how you evaluate that. Yes. Um, straight out. Um, MDMA, which is currently under FDA approval process, F MDMA in many situations is perfect when a, you can feel a, that a person lives with a lot of anxiety. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, the test they're doing now, the research is about PTSD, which of course is anxiety writ large. Uh, but MDMA is wonderful for the reduction of anxiety. And as a therapist, as a skilled facilitator, you might assume, you might, you might um, uh, come to an, you know, an understanding yourself that this, this is really going to go somewhere if we can reduce the anxiety in this person. So you, you talk about it and then, you get there. I personally have seen it done through the MAPS uh, situation and the MAPS training and uh, with those marvelous people uh, who, are, who are doing the, the therapy, completely wonderful people. Um, and and you, we all know them. 
uh, I've seen it do that. So MD MDMA is great at reducing a life's worth of anxiety in an hour and 10 minutes. And then the question becomes, who are you without your anxiety? That becomes the question. Who are you actually without your anxiety? Do you know who you are without your anxiety? A lot of people don't. And I could say I'm one of them that, that's, that's been through that one. Uh, and then um, uh, uh, medicine like psilocybin uh, with, a, with a very loving assist and a, and a, a kind of an embrace with, with, uh, from a facilitator. And, um, psilocybin uh, invites people uh, beyond all of their, their, their cognitive limits, or long, their, or beyond their conclusions of life. Beyond, uh, it invites them into ex experiencing life as a as a magical production. The wonder of it, the way the way a one year old does, the way a one year old does, and and um, that's it. It doesn't immediately reduce anxiety. In fact, it's a more of a neurological event than it is an anxiety reduction event. So some people who are very prone to running the world from a I've got to be in control perspective might find it a little difficult to use uh, psilocybin uh, 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 you know, from the get-go. That being said, there are geniuses you know, working at, at uh, Johns Hopkins and other places who have encountered this over and over again, have a lot to say about using that, using those things. Um, uh, similarly, you could find uses for LSD with addiction training, uh, addiction um, rehab stuff. And uh, I'm being very general right now. Ketamine is wonderful uh, for uh, pr producing neurologically uh, the absence of a lived with depression, especially treatment resistant depression, which leaves people feeling completely burdened and down. And, and if you as a facilitator assess that it would be good for that person not to feel that, the ketamine's a good way there, maybe two, maybe three, maybe more applications. And then that person, you, you say to that person, okay, who are you without depression? Let's get to know you without depression it, that saps the, the vibrancy of your life. Let's, or anxiety, which saps the, the, the vibrancy of your presence. Let's do really that. Really fostering and encouraging an emergence of a different yes. sense of self, sense of being in the world, yes. which is so it's, it's, exquisite. Gita, these medicines provide an opportunity for the facilitator and the person they're working with to enter into the dance of all time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an existential choreography that is, that is both human and loving, and it's both a, expanded beyond the limits of, of what self has. It's both. And it's an opportunity for not only for people uh, who lived long with something like depression to get, to get better, as it were, but it's an opportunity for therapists to celebrate themselves and what they know and to, to be in the dance of life rather than just be in the dance of, of handing out pills or be in the dance that the hopeless, the hopeless medical model based approach to often trying to, to help people and fix people. The, the substances, all those ones I mentioned, plus other ones, are an invitation into risking the dance of life between and among souls. Thank you so much for your wisdom, Barry. It's a pleasure and delight to have you and talk to you on the show today. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.